his day, 1919, one Baron von Winterfeld checked into Berlin's most lavish hotel, the Ardlon. He stayed in suite number 130 and disappeared the following day as the money porter, Oskar Lange, was reported missing. They later found Lange's body strangled in the hotel suite. The list of stolen valuables included jewelry, stocks, and more than 200 gold marks in cash. A reward of 10,000 marks was offered for any information that could lead to the arrest of the fake baron. The man's real name was Wilhelm Blumer. The 44-year-old was a writer and desperate to see his dramas performed on stages across the world. But to realize his dream, he needed money, lots of it. Oskar Lange had been his third victim. Eventually, the poet was tracked down in Dresden. Soon after his arrest, he cut his wrists. Today, his name can only be found in old police files and in the annals of Hotel Ardlon. For over a century, this grand hotel on Parisa Platz has set the stage for great dramas and comedies, for spectacular entrances and tragic departures. A luxury hotel with a distinctive aura. Inaugurated in 1907, destroyed at the end of World War II, and reopened in 1997, the Ardlon is situated in the heart of Berlin. The Ardlon's vibrant history is its greatest asset. A legend you can check out and check into, right in Germany's political epicenter. was a meeting place for kings, princes, for key players in international finance, for idolized artists, and for women whose names were splashed across the marquees of theaters and cinemas, or whose only talent it was to be beautiful. So said the Grand Dame who made the Ardlon her main stage for a quarter of a century. Hedwig Leiten, known as Hedda, arrived in Berlin in 1920. Before that, she had lived in the United States for years. At the Ardlon's New Year's Eve ball, she caught the eye of hotel heir Louis Ardlon. The father of five promptly divorced his wife, Tilly, and Hedda became the new matron of the house, and incidentally, its key historian. Hedda? Hedda saw Louis and told her friend, that's the man I'm going to marry. And she took advantage of the fact that the marriage between Tilly and Louis was falling apart. Inside the family, she was also known as Hedda, that stupid cow. Hedda, das Mistvieh, genannt. By the time the headstrong Hedda joined the Ardlon family, the house built by her father-in-law had been standing for over a decade. The Ardlon had opened its doors in 1907 and prided itself as Germany's most modern and luxurious hotel. Imperial Germany was at the height of its power. The economy was flourishing, prosperity grew. In just a few years, Germany had blossomed into a modern industrial nation. Around the turn of the 19th century, Germany had even overtaken Great Britain as Europe's leading economic power. As a young imperial capital, Berlin was in a rapid upswing. Berlin was really booming at the time. It started when the Second Reich was founded, and Berlin went from being a city in the Kingdom of Prussia to the capital of the whole German Empire. And that brought it closer to being a world power. 
When the empire was founded in 1870-71, Berlin counted one million inhabitants. By the start of World War I, there were four million. So in those 40 years, the population had exploded and changed the face of the capital. New buildings cropped up, cultural life became more incandescent and interesting, and luxury found its way into the city. And that's where Hedda's father-in-law, Lorenz Adlon, came in. The son of a craftsman from Mainz, he moved to Berlin in 1880 and amassed a huge fortune as a gastronomer. He was clearly a brilliant entrepreneur, extremely good at organizing and with an instinct for what was in at the time. What people really wanted to eat and drink, what kind of decor they wanted to see. He knew there was a certain type of longing, of Wanderlust, in German society. So many of his establishments showcased French and Italian cuisine. By the 1900s, Lorenz Adlon already owned several restaurants in Berlin. Among them was a large terrace restaurant at the Zoological Garden. He was a fantastic cook. At the coffee house by the zoo, he didn't sell ice cream, he sold gelato. He even got an Italian to make it. That was completely new in Berlin. In a way, you could say he helped revolutionize the culinary industry in Berlin. In just a few years, my father-in-law earned about two million marks from the zoo's terrace restaurant alone. He wasn't copying the Parisian style, his restaurant simply was Parisian. His chefs came from Paris, and the head waiters spoke every language. All of a sudden, Berlin was serving bouillabaisse, boiled squid, lobster pie, and shark fin soup. Even the imperial family would dine at his establishments, a high honor for a former carpenter. And so Lorenz Adlon could be sure of his emperor's support when he embarked on his most daring project yet. Here at Pariser Platz, he dreamt of building a modern grand hotel. Wilhelm II was eager to transform Berlin, his city, his capital, into the epicenter of an empire. He wanted it to be as splendid, glamorous and sensational as possible. Of course, that paired perfectly with an entrepreneur who promised to build the most distinguished hotel in the world. It was a natural fit for this image of a new glitzy metropolis. The emperor was a fan of new technology. He supported the emerging German business class and paid no heed to religion or ancestry when handing out orders and honorary titles to the rising economic pillars of his empire. From the start, Adlon's hotel project was designed to please the emperor. Construction amounted to 17 million gold marks. Lorenz took two million out of his own fortune and paid the rest with loans. The investment equated to over 40,000 gold marks per bed. The annual salary in Germany at the time was not even 1,000 marks. When the Ardland was complete, the press spoke of a German hotel that offered the world something unrivaled and unprecedented. Each bathroom provided running, heated water. Such luxury astonished even the emperor himself, as Hedda Ardlon recounted. During his tour of the hotel, the emperor turned on every hot water tap in every bathroom he visited, all the way from the princely suites on the first floor to the simple rooms on the fourth floor. He wanted to see if they actually worked. The emperor absolutely loved the Adlon. He practically scolded his bursar, saying, why don't we have such beautiful carpets? Everything is so magnificent, and my place is drafty and cold. He immediately started using the Adlon to house esteemed guests, and in a way that's still what the Adlon does today. But even more defining than the rugs and the taps was the culinary experience. The wine cellar was stocked with a quarter of a million bottles, and the in-house restaurants offered a variety of fine and exotic dishes. Mm -hmm. 
and inside the kitchen, it was a Frenchman who was king of the castle. But whether the head chef really was French master chef Auguste Escoffier, as Hedda Ardlon claimed, remains uncertain. Either way, the Ardlon's gastronomy certainly stood up to international comparison. And even today, more than a century later, culinary arts at the hotel would surely measure up to Escoffier's high standards. The in-house restaurant Lorenz Adlon S. Zimmer boasts two Michelin stars. I still have this book by Escoffier. It was even signed by him, by the way. When you look through it, you can find an abundance of recipes and ingredients. He'd cook with oysters, seagull eggs, truffles. The things he was concerned with back then are still relevant today. He would ask himself, how should service be experienced? What do guests want? Are we up to date? And what can we develop that's new and innovative? To me, those questions are as important today as they were 100 years ago. When Wilhelm II hosted his uncle, King Edward VII, they of course supped at the Adlon. Hendrik Otto is recreating the dish of sole they were served back then. But nowadays, he wouldn't ever serve this fish with the same sauce Escoffier recommended. Tastes change, but one thing never does. A kitchen's fate is determined by its reputation. Wherever the emperor dined, his subjects would follow, at least those who could afford to. In addition to its choice cuisine, the Adlon also offered a variety of lounges that served different purposes. Whether saloons for bustling soirees, meeting halls for secret negotiations, or something more intimate for an afternoon rendezvous, the Adlon provided just the right setting for any occasion. Und das and that attracted a new upper class who may not have had such a fixed meeting place otherwise. There was the castle, sure, where the court and nobility and perhaps the highest echelons of society would meet. But in the Adlon, old aristocrats could encounter new money. And that was celebrated like nowhere else. This here is the grandiose reception hall of the old Adlon. The hall at the Adlon used to be legendary for people parading down the grand staircase to make their entrance. That's been completely lost nowadays. I don't know of any hotel where that still happens today. In February 1913, the Emperor's daughter, Princess Victoria Luisa of Prussia, and Prince Ernst August of Hanover announced their engagement. Overnight, the Adlon became the most sought-after address in Europe. Telegrams and express letters poured in by the basketful. The telephone was ringing off the hook. But the Emperor's guests had already booked nearly every single bed we had, so we had to send out countless cancellations all over the world. British monarch King George V came, as did Russian Tsar Nicholas II, who took a carriage ride through Berlin with the father of the bride. The wedding of Victoria Luisa followed a choreography that dates back to the 17th century, but was still being upheld in the 20th century. And so, just one year before the First World War, the English king and the Russian Tsar came to Berlin for this grand family celebration. You see, the three monarchs were also cousins. 
It was such a peculiar moment in time when everything seemed to blossom one last time before this whole world came crashing down in the war. If what Hedda Ardlon says is true, the hotel narrowly escaped disaster at the time. Russian anarchists aiming to kill the Tsar are said to have planted a bomb in the Ardlon. But the attack was thwarted. This story, recounted only by Hedda, is another one of the hotel's legends. In the end, it was the noble wedding guests themselves who were the real threat, as they blew up old Europe with the start of World War I in August 1914. And so German soldiers marched off to battle through the Brandenburg Gate, just a stone's throw away from where the war's key players had dined mere months before. But the three cousins were now enemies. The speedy victory all had expected did not materialize. As the war dragged on, most large luxury hotels closed down. But not the Adlon. Amidst four long years of carnage, the Adlon kept itself busy with back-to-back -back reservations. Not a single room was empty during the war. One agency after the next was set up in Berlin, and the people running them would rent apartments in our house for years at a time. Then in 1918, the November Revolution took place in Berlin. Shots flew across Pariser Platz and under the Brandenburg Gate, smashing the windows of the Adlon's corner apartments. In the end, the emperor abdicated, and revolutionary troops searched his majesty's favorite hotel for weapons and officers. The fighting raged on for days. It wasn't until January 1919 that the new social democratic government was able to assert itself with the help of massive military support. Lorenz Adlon was approaching 70 and had to watch his whole world crumble. He loved the emperor. Our family coat of arms is an eagle with a globe underneath it, the imperial orb. Lorenz had received permission from the emperor to use the imperial orb in his family coat of arms. Underneath it reads, Adlon oblige, so he was very close to the emperor. Adlon oblige, like nobility, Adlon was a duty. But what did that mean now that the emperor was in exile and Germany a republic? The elephant fountain at the Adlon today is a replica. The original was in the hotel's atrium. In 1919, American soldiers were filmed there, the victors of the war touring Berlin. This all went beyond Lorenz Adlon's comprehension. When the emperor went into exile, Lorenz would walk to the center of the Brandenburg Gate every day and wait for him. Eventually, the inevitable happened. Unaccustomed to traffic near his hotel, Lorenz Adlon was struck by an oncoming vehicle. It's important to note that up until World War I, only the Emperor could pass through the Brandenburg Gate, no one else. When Lorenz Adlon died in 1921, his son Louis, who was very familiar with the hotel business, officially took over the reins. He led the Adlon into its most glorious era. And right by his side, Hedda, in and outside of the office. From that day on, the entire staff recognized me as their boss and patroness. The knowledge I'd acquired in America was of great use to me at work. Hedda had brought a large waterfront property just outside of Berlin into the marriage. Here on Lake Lenitz, the couple had a villa known as the Adlon House. 
It was a great honor to be invited to the Atlon House. They must have thrown lavish parties there for their inner circle. For larger parties, the couple still had Hotel Atlon, and business was booming there, even without the emperor's patronage. It was the golden age of the Roaring Twenties. Guests from all over the world flocked to Berlin to do business, or simply to enjoy themselves in Europe's new Sin City. Berlin was not as expensive as other metropolises. In Berlin, you could get away with much more than you could elsewhere. Almost anything was allowed. It was far more liberal than other cities. It was a time of hyperinflation when a fistful of dollars was enough to entertain guests for nights on end. In 1922, the leftist journalist Karl von Ossietzky wrote, the Kanzler Ecke is the best spot for foreign currencies. From there to the Atlon, there's a stretch of land that technically belongs to Germany. But ever since the crash, it's actually more of an external territory. There you will encounter every language, every currency, and every type of clothing. This was a city where everything that imperial cultural policy had held back for decades suddenly broke free. A new theater, Brecht's theater, emerged. All these art movements, from Dadaism to Surrealism to new objectivity, it all surfaced all at once. Breakdown and breakthrough are very closely related. I think that fostered a creative density and an intensity that didn't exist in other cities. So in anderen Städten nicht gibt. The Ardlon capitalized on the times. The hotel becomes a fixed address for Berlin's entertainment scene. Tea dances were held here in the afternoons. Hedda Ardlon claimed it was her idea to coax mature ladies from high society to the hotel with in-house male dancers for hire, or gigolos. With this scheme, the hotel made its mark in music history. The role of the dashing Lola in The Blue Angel made Marlene Dietrich an international star in 1930. And when she showed up at the Ardlon, she was caught in a frenzy of camera flashes. The Ardlon and the stars. Charlie Chaplin liked to stay here. His signature can be found in the hotel's old guest book. It reads like a who's who of the interwar period. Ernst Lubitsch, Harold Lloyd, Enrico Caruso, Emil Jannings, Sinclair Lewis, Thomas Mann, and Albert Einstein. Paula Negri is a silver screen legend. When she pulled up to the Adlon, the bellhops stood at attention, as did the gossip reporters. So when it was uncovered that Paula Negri occasionally shared her suite with Louis Adlon Jr., who had just come of age, a scandal ensued. Louis and Paula were infatuated with each other. So when she checked into the Adlon alone and Louis was around, she would take him to her room. It was simply unheard of that Louis would break the golden rule of never sleeping with the clientele. Bellhops also stood at attention for little Jackie Coogan, the kid in Charlie Chaplin's famous silent film. On tour through Europe, this is his proud father presenting him to his adoring fans from their window overlooking Pariser Platz. In 2002, a contrasting scene occurred when Michael Jackson hoisted his son over the railing. We can't really influence how our guests behave. But of course, the more famous the guest is, the more security must be put into place. Whether pop stars, presidents or private citizens, everyone is welcome to the Adlon, as long as they can foot the bill, no matter if they are accompanied by a throng of fans or a motorcycle escort. 
there's even a Rolls-Royce limousine service available for excursions. And even if a person is traveling in the service of world revolution, she will find a bourgeois bed at the Adlon, like this guest. Alexandra Kolontai was an ardent communist who joined Lenin in the revolution. She became one of his closest collaborators and was a commissar responsible for social issues. Berlin's communists were outraged by Kolontai, who made appearances draped in expensive furs. In the Red Flag newspaper, they even urged Moscow to recall this luxury-loving comrade to her homeland. Moscow's embassy was just down the street from the Artlon Hotel. Cultural icons rubbed shoulders at receptions. Many artists and intellectuals sympathized with the communists. Confidence in the Weimar Republic was waning, especially as the Great Depression of the 1930s led to mass unemployment and poverty in Germany. Reichstag was also just a few minutes walk from the Adlon. Here it was not only the communists who were gaining traction, but also the National Socialist Party. Nazi celebrities were increasingly seen dining with representatives of big business and the world of finance. But not at the Adlon. Adolf Hitler preferred Hotel Kaiserhof on nearby Wilhelmstrasse. From 1918 onwards, it was the usual haunt for the far right. The Nazis had occupied the Kaiserhof. The name speaks for itself. They saw themselves as the master race, and so they chose the Kaiserhof, the imperial court. Perhaps Louis and Hedda Adlon were too liberal for their taste, as was the whole society that frequented their establishment. The Kaiserhof was where Hitler, originally from Austria, took on German citizenship. That means it was a focal point for him. So it's not surprising that strategic meetings also took place there in the immediate run up to the seizure of power. In January 1933, Hitler shocked the establishment when he snatched the chancellorship and rose to power. The Nazi Party paramilitary, the SA, paraded through the Brandenburg Gate to the doomed parliament to celebrate their new leader. Hedda watched the procession from the Adlon. The march lasted until after midnight. The torches formed a stream of fire with one wave after another. The Adlons, seen here beneath swastika flags, quickly realized they had to fall in line if they wanted to continue operating their hotel. Louis Adlon had accumulated huge debt after his father's death. He had had to pay out his siblings' inheritance and had taken out loans to do that. As had been the case during the Imperial era and the Weimar Republic, the Adlon's central location made it a political hotspot. In 1933, Parts of the hotel were rented out to the Nazi party's foreign office. The Nazis held propaganda lectures for foreign guests in the Adlon's conference rooms, hoping the dignified ambience would exude respectability. The Nazis were drawn to the Adlon. Why? And why the Foreign Office specifically? The Adlon was the most international house there was, and the hotel projected that image out into the world. The Nazis took advantage of that. From 1933 to 1941, that went well. Then people started noticing that one of the most important business couples in Berlin was not in the party. 
That didn't look good. They had to join. And so Hedda and Louis Ardlon joined the ranks of what would become over 8 million members of the NSDAP. In 1936, a glimmer of the Ardlon's former glory returned when the Olympic Games were held in Berlin. The Olympic Committee took up quarters in the hotel, and for a brief time, a multilingual, colorful life dotted the uniform, depressing landscape of the Brown dictatorship. In front of our house, elegant French women strolled in delicate heels and exquisite footwear. Sporty American women wore Goodyear sports shoes, and in between there were officers in uniform. That was the outward and glamorous impression of those days. Today, the square behind the Adlon houses the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. of the Holocaust were also former hotel guests and employees. Deported and murdered while the Adlon was still desperately trying to cling to the nonchalance of a bygone age. Were they able to salvage the joie de vivre of the old days? No, of course not. Because the zest for life, the freedoms were gone. All the good entertainers, and I hate to put it this way, but it's true, had either fled or been murdered. It was a dark time. World War II began in 1939, and the Ardlon prepared for the worst. In 1992, the remains of the hotel's air raid shelter were uncovered. This was where the Ardlon family and their remaining guests spent many nights during the war. The bunker was luxurious. They had moved down carpets and the furniture from upstairs. The wine cellar was extremely well stocked. You could find the high-ranking hotel guests down there. And artists from the Prussian State Theater would also come whenever there was a bomb scare. They would gather in the cellar and enjoy themselves. Cheerful champagne popping while outside, the city was being destroyed. Allied air raids left hundreds of thousands of Berliners homeless. The Adlon, however, remained virtually unscathed. In the fierce battle over the capital, the hotel served as a military hospital. This is footage by Soviet cameramen immediately after the building was occupied. And then, the Adlon's huge wine cellar became its downfall. Even after more than five years of war, it was still lavishly stocked. After the war had ended, Soviet soldiers struck upon this gold mine. They raided the shelves and apparently through a carelessly discarded cigarette, caused the Adlon to go up in flames. The Adlon burned down in the night on May 2nd, 1945. The Russians found one million bottles of wine in the cellar, so of course they decided it was time to celebrate. And rightly so, I would have done the same after the hell they had just gone through. Louis and Hedda Adlon spent the rest of the war in their villa on Lake Lenitz. The Russians broke in. A servant came from the direction of the kitchen and shouted, No, stop, you don't understand. 
Nein, lassen Sie das. This is the home of Louis Adlon, the hotelier, the general manager of the Hotel Adlon. And what did the Russians hear? General. The Russians couldn't find anything, so they released him and threw him out. There he had a heart attack and died on the streets. After Berlin was divided, Pariser Platz, and with it, the remains of the famous Hotel Adlon, became part of the Soviet sector. This is footage from the summer of 1945. In a preserved side wing on Wilhelmstrasse, hotel operations continued. The family name Ardlon remained, even though the former owner had been ousted. The most beautiful parts were burned down. The rooms along the side street were still somewhat preserved, but they had been for the simple tourists. The grandiose suites and apartments all faced the Brandenburg Gate and the boulevard Unter den Linden. Only the poor people's rooms, as it were, were spared. And from 1946 onwards, emigrants returning from abroad, such as Brecht, Weigel, Anna Zegers, moved into these rooms, and they stayed there for a few weeks until they could find a place to live, but there simply weren't enough funds to rebuild the front section of the hotel. After the Berlin Wall was built in 1961, the East German administration preferred to accommodate international guests out of sight of the militaristic border installation. The Adlon, however, was located directly on the death strip. And so in the early 1980s, the last remnants of the hotel were demolished. But the legend lived on. Hedda Ardlon, who by that time had moved to Munich, made sure of it. As early as 1955, the hotelier's widow committed the Ardlon's long history to paper. It quickly became a bestseller. Hedda then sold the rights to the name Ardlon to the heir of the Kempinski Hotelier family. Hedda came to an agreement with him and received enough royalties to comfortably live out the rest of her life. This contract granted him preemptive rights for the real estate and the right to rebuild the hotel together with the Adlon family. That was Hedda's vision. In her book, she writes, if there is to be an Adlon, it must be on the same spot. She had received a ton of offers to rebuild the Adlon somewhere else, but she insisted on that place. Hedda Adlon died in 1967. 22 years later, her vision for Germany started to become reality as the Iron Curtain fell and Berlin and Germany were reunited. The deck was also reshuffled at Pariser Platz. The Berlin Senate sold the 6,000 square meter plot on which the old hotel had stood on the condition that a new luxury hotel be built in its stead. The new Adlon opened in 1997 amidst a palpable longing to revive Berlin's old standing as a world metropolis. Architecturally, the new hotel is similar to its predecessor. The conservative ambience suggests continuity, almost as if to blot out its historical fractures. II has left his mark throughout the great halls. The interior pays homage to the hotel's checkered past in muted colors, with no frills to detract from the quiet comfort of days long past. 
The tradition and history of the hotel dates back to 1907, so we've included various design elements from the original site in today's building. That includes, for example, our antique-looking elevators, the elephant fountain in the lobby, or the emperor's bust in our gourmet restaurant. The name Adlon is extremely important to us, even in this day and age. Guests visiting the Adlon can escape into another era and slip from this century to the last. The hotel service is designed to pamper their guests as unobtrusively as possible with luxurious coziness at every level. Several restaurants and a two-star gourmet kitchen beckon guests to dine. Here they still cook for chancellors and presidents. And so the guest book has started filling up once again with one illustrious name after another, the Dalai Lama, the Queen and her late husband, and Bill Clinton, to name a few. With its imperial suite, presidential suite, royal and junior suites, the Adlon is well-equipped for all kinds of visitors. Here you'll find king-size beds where actual kings have laid their heads down, with a view that's hard to beat. The standards of this five-star hotel are upheld by about 500 employees. They're the ones tasked with defending the Adlon's good reputation in their daily dealings with discerning guests. Their job is to breathe new life into the Adlon. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So that the legendary Grand Hotel on Parisa Platz not only has a storied past, but also a promising future. <laughs>